Greetings ladies and gentlemen, Jeremy Adrian here, welcome back to the channel, let's talk some Guild Wars 2. I've been busy playing my heart out with Guild Wars 2's latest Living World content, Episode 3, Long Live the Lich, from the current season. I'm here to share some thoughts about what's exciting and new and what can be improved on for upcoming episodes. As usual, there will be two parts with the spoiler section for the story coming later on in the video. Dun, 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 Alrighty, the latest episode, as we know, continues the current Living World story where the commander, you, and your companions take the fight to Palawa Joko, finally. He's been tearing it up all over Teria, and the story starts at Amnoon, where you meet up with Taimi, Gorik, and Blish before things go south real quick, as Joko pays a visit. From here on out, things pick up in urgency, and we decide to take the fight to him and stop him before he unleashes the Scarab Plague on the world. To do this, the clever Asuras find a way to port you and your allies into Joko's domain of Korna, the map where Gandara is Moonlight Fortress is. This is your brief summary on the happenings this episode. But hey, one of the big things we know that comes with episode 3 is the brand new Roller Beetle Mount, so let's start off with that. The Roller Beetle is the 6th mount in Guild Wars 2, and right off the bat, after I got it, I played around with it, obviously, for about an hour or so, just running around the domain of Korna, or rolling around, I should say, and I gotta say, I really like the Roller Beetle a lot. Now, getting the Roller Beetle is tied to the story progression as well. It requires you to move the chapters along, and then there's going to be a series of two collections that you must complete, and all the items, like the Beetle Juice collection and the Beetle Saddle collection, takes place within the domain of Korna itself. And even right now, there's tons of guides available, so for new players wanting to get the Roller Beetle, it's safe to say that's going to be pretty easy for you to find where these items are. So what's the Roller Beetle about? The Roller Beetle, as you'd expect, also has its own mastery tree line, and to unlock the three mastery skills is going to require a total of 12 Path of Fire mastery points. The first one is Racking Ball, and this pretty much is your basic attack, where you can learn to launch foes a short distance by rolling over them with the Roller Beetle's Engage skill rollout. The next one is Barrier Smash, and this one's pretty interesting, because once you unlock this mastery, there's going to be areas in the Domain of Korna map, where you'll see that there are caverns that are kind of blocked by stones, and then there's going to be an icon of the Beetle on the front, so you know that you can just run over and smash that entrance wall to get into hidden places, and usually, having found out and done a bunch of these myself, these lead to secret POIs, treasure chests, and all that good stuff. And the final mastery one is called Big Air, and this costs 5 POF masteries to learn to perform stylish airborne tricks after boosting to regain your endurance. So what does all that mean? The special ability for the Roller Beetle is a boost. I'm not even sure if it's called boost, but just think of it as speed up and boost, and when you hit that space bar, your beetle just goes into like a NOS overdrive mode and just speeds on the landscape. So if you're going downhill, it's already going to be fast because, duh, physics. But by hitting the boost, you go extremely fast and you'll be able to drift on the landscape too. Hitting the C button and then moving your beetle in a direction will drift your beetle to that direction. So think of it as like a racing car when you just you know make a sharp turn and you do this cool drift before you move on to the left or right. That, aesthetically, is one of the coolest things I've ever seen from a Guild Wars 2 mount, and it actually feels great. The thing is, turning when you've boosted your beetle is really, really hard, so this is one of the hardest mounts to control in Guild Wars 2 at the moment, and it's going to take you a long time, well at least it took me a long time to get the hang of it. And one of the coolest things too is that once you've boosted your beetle and when you're about to go off a ramp, that is when the second mastery comes into play because by hitting your boost button, you can do like airborne tricks where you'll see you, the character, perform some sort of BMX style skills, which is incredible to watch. I mean, no other mounts has this at the moment, so this is actually really, really cool. Now, just to wrap up the beetle overall, and I've said this on stream as well, it's definitely an interesting mount, and it has its uses. It could be one of the fastest landscape mounts ever for Guild Wars 2 if the map in question has a lot of open spaces for you to use the beetle mount. In the Heart of Thorns areas, for example, is probably one of the 
least likely places you will roll out your roller beetle unless you really need it to get somewhere really really fast with that boost button. Otherwise, Domain of Korna and other POF areas are actually great for the beetle. And by default, because it's been, what, a week or so now since the episode come out, I have seen a lot of players in game, they've still stuck to their basic default mounts, which are either the, the Raptor or the Griffin in terms of which mounts will you use more on a daily basis for everything? Basic movements across towns and areas. I personally use my Griffin almost all the time. Number one, because I've spent 200 gold and about two days straight of just farming the collections that I need to get the Griffin in the first place. So that has become my default mount by virtue of just how much work I've put into it and how useful the Griffin is for navigating your basic areas. While I did enjoy what the beetle offers, especially in the domain of Korna, where, you know, you can smash through all these hidden beetle-only accessible areas, besides that, I haven't really found a real good reason to use my beetle in the Corteria maps or Heart of Thorns, for example. So for those of you that have already unlocked the beetle mount, feel free to share what you think about the beetle mount in the comment section below. Is it your favorite Guild Wars 2 mount right now, or are you still preferring your defaults like the Raptor or the Griffin? Let me know. All right, next up, let's talk about the brand new map, the Domain of Korna. Korna is where Joko's stronghold, Gandara, is. So all his awakened military forces are here, in addition to the inquest that he's grabbed along the way to come up with the tech required to fend off people like us. And based on where we are with the story, the Domain of Korna sees you, the commander, and your allies come here through an unorthodox method and try and set up shop and break down his defenses and take the fight to him. Now, the domain of Korna is slightly bigger than the previous map we got, which was the Sand Swept Isles, but not as big as the first map of the Living World Season 4, which is the domain of Ishtan. And in case you were wondering, yes, the heart tasks are back as usual, and there's five of them to do scattered in uh, four corners of the map and one right in the middle where Ritlock is centered right outside the fortress. Now, the story involving these hearts depends on which one you're going for. At the bottom left corner is where you'll be working with the Corsairs. At the top left, you're helping the locals in the domain of Korna and the stories about how Joko is oppressing them and they have lack of food, so you have to hunt rat meat and burn infected crops that already have the scarab plague within them. So obviously you can't eat that. Toward the right side of the map near the Dabiji Hollows area, you're working with some local hunters in the region. They're kind of like Hylek. And at the Allied Encampment, there's going to be a heart task as well to root out Awakened Spies. And finally, at Ridlock himself, this is where you'll start killing Awakened and Inquest in the front lines. So based on all the five heart tasks, I mean, they are going to be important as usual because you got to do them once a day to unlock the Karma Vendors, which is where you're going to have to pick up some of the collection items, both for the Beetle collection and of course the meta achievement collection too which is going to be an ascendant backpack with the title dauntless as far as these hard task objectives go i think i've made my feelings clear a long time ago about them being repeatable and how pain in the ass it is uh, simply because some of the objectives here really are well unsavory Especially for this map, I think everybody wouldn't mind doing any of the others because the ones where you're hunting for rat meat or, you know, burning the crops or helping the Corsair or, you know, th those kind of things are easy to do. But the one in the Allied Encampment, there's two things that frustrates me the most about it. The first one being that you have to hunt Allied Spies hidden throughout the Allied Encampment. And this is like a, a former town or city where, you know, there's it's not very big. And you're looking for undead chickens, really. The thing is, at launch, I mean, everybody's doing it. And it's very hard to find one that spawned. And even if something spawned and you're on the way there to kill it, somebody else has already shot it from, like, you know, 30 meters I had their, their dead eye or something. So it's, it's kind of frustrating at the very beginning because the other objective to complete this task is to collect tasteless roots. And these spawn pretty much everywhere around the Allied Cabin. The thing is, you're, you're going to be spending so much time collecting these 
uh, to turn it in to even make some progress on the hard task. So this one's kind of annoying. Does the new map have a meta event? Yes, it does. And it's called containing the Scarab Plague. Now, this is the big one. And unlike a lot of the other ones, for example, Palawadan and Ishtan, it isn't on a timer. And it relies on a map-wide collecting and turning in event, whereby killing enemies on the landscape, especially Inquest and Awaken, will give you scrap parts. And players will then... Uh, uh, turn in the scrap parts at the camp where Ritlock is right on the front lines and this is a map wide event so as soon as there's enough scrap parts the meta event to assault Joko's fortress begins. The pre-meta involves escorting saboteurs to three different cannon locations in Korna and once all those cannons have been taken back and reprogrammed uh, to shoot the that shield that's cur currently covering Gandara that's when players are able to go and storm the fortress kill this inquest brainiac dude kill the golem that he summons and then the looting phase begins once the golem dies and the asura pops out everybody has to tap that asura in order to get an excess card drop in your inventory and clicking on that card will give you a buff to enter a loot room in there you'll find all kinds of corner caches and other good stuff as well in total the entire containing the scarab plague meta doesn't take more than half an hour to run and in fact if a map is very active like it was in the first two or three days of launch where everybody was turning in scrap parts almost all the time the event was running pretty much every hour on top of the hour it was really really fun to be a part of the fight was pretty fun but it has to be said you know it's one of the shortest metas available at the moment and in terms of loot drop it's never going to beat Palawadan. Now the reason for running the meta however is number one you will need to kill that golem dude at least once uh, to get the achievement for the backpack or for the back ascended item I should say and secondly it's also a great source of inscribed shards. Now inscribed shards are the current map card that you will need to buy a bunch of things from the karma vendors in the area. You will also need a bunch of inscribed shards. I think it's 700 in total if you're going for the Tyrion service medal achievement, the one where you need to get the exotic back slot item before you get the ascended version. So you'll be forming a lot of the daily heart tasks in addition to doing this meta every time it's up for inscribed shards. Now if you don't just want to do this stuff and want to diversify the ways you can get inscribed shards then you can just travel around the map and see them lying around in areas where you'll see the icon of the inscribed shard on the map. You just go pick one up and that's just going to count as one. But doing the meta usually results in five inscribed shards whereas completing those heart objectives and talking to the karma vendor you can get a bundle of five inscribed shards for about 2.7 K karma I believe. So if you're sitting on millions of karma and you really want to up your number of inscribed shards then feel free to purchase them after completing the daily heart tasks. So as far as the domain of Korna is concerned, is it one of my favorite living world season maps? I mean, it's not. It's up there as one of the smallest ones. And I do appreciate having a smaller than usual map because that makes traveling around easier, especially for me on my Griffin, because there's going to be a, a, a long wall vine thing around the area that's going to be a pain in the butt to traverse through if you do not have a Springer or a Griffin, but everybody has that. So that's kind of cool because there's only going to be certain areas of this vine wall where there's going to be entrances and of course there's going to be other events as well that takes place there like rebuild the vine or def defend areas at the vine wall and stuff like that but besides that nothing else to shout out about about the domain of Korna. now let's talk about the Tyrion service medal for a bit the ascended backpack achievement and item collection as well this one was something that i didn't want to take part in simply because I, I felt I didn't have the time and I had to move on to another game and that you know I really wasn't gonna get it anyway but I ended up doing it because I got sucked into the whole moment of hey you know what since I'm playing Guild Wars 2 for this review of episode 3 I may as well go in all the way and at least get one ascended backpack because I did not do the ones for any of the other previous living world seasons which is basically any achievement towards a, an item collection thing. This one, I gotta say, was somewhat fun in a sense that it made you go all over Tyria, the core areas of the game, to either kill bosses or collect items or do events that I may have not done in a very long time. For example, for the Tyrian Service Medal, players had to go back to Ore 
and do all the temple events as part of the collection. But that has its pros and cons and the pros is being able to go back to older areas like Or to do all these temple events which I personally haven't done in a very long time since I hit level 70 or something for my review way back in March of 2017. So it's cool going back to Or and doing all that stuff. The bad is, you know, some of these collection design in terms of having to wait for certain events or having to do certain events to get them can be kind of frustrating. For example, when let's take the Temples of Ore. Some of them involves, you know, just simple defend and you should be done. But there are others like the Temple of Melandru, for example, which uh, the event has to fail in order for you to retake it and then get the credit for achievement by killing the priestess or whatever. And a lot of people just had a very difficult time with that because pugs or just general population in general just wanted to get done with the event regardless of, you know, being a success or failure. And it was a real pain in the butt. And uh, I did not find that enjoyable because it took me about a day just to get that one temple, the Temple of Melandru, which the event had to fail in order for you to take it back and kill the priestess or whatever that's there for you to get that uh, achievement done. And that wraps up the PV section about the Domain of Korna and the Roller Beetle and the achievements as well for the back item. Now let's talk about the story. So guys, this is going to be your spoiler warning. I'm going to go into some really spoiler horrific stuff here. So if you've not caught up with the Guild Wars 2 Living World Season 4 Episode 1s and 2 story, then... I highly recommend not watching this part and coming back after you've played it. Now again, toward the end of the last episode, we know Joko was up to something because he stole a lot of the inquest tech and he made a lot of inquest into Awaken and everything. And the repercussion of that is, you know, out in the open world Terra area, sometimes Joko's Awakened will storm and raid areas and that becomes an event in itself. And I've taken part in a few of those and that was really fun. So that's the re repercussions of Joko doing his thing in the previous episode. This episode is all about revenge as well, you know, from the very beginning in the first chapter, which is Seas, you, the commander, go and meet up with Taimi in Amnoon because Gorik got into a little trouble. He was kind of experimenting on the Scarab Plague and finding a way to stop the Scarab Plague and he, being an entomologist, came up with this solution, which is the beetle. So he's been growing a beetle under his skin, and unfortunately the free people of Amnoon think that it, that's weird, and so they decide to put him on trial, and that's where you come in. You go and you know get him out of that sticky situation. And then you find out that Lord Farron is back, of course, and that's one of the funniest things. I do like Lord Farron. He's somewhat of a comedy really type of character, uh, but things go south really quickly in Seeds because Palawa Joko pays a visit. He's hijacked a Crichton ship and infected everybody on board with the Scarab Plague. So that is crappy and then that's going to be your first boss fight as well which was kind of challenging fighting one of joko's lieutenants i really liked that fight because some of the achievements were pretty fun um, because you have to get on your mount for starters and then you got to run over all the scarab plague things on the ground which is your first introduction to one of the events when you get to the domain of corona later Moving on though to the second chapter and that is Forearmed is Forewarned. Now this one is rather interesting for me. This one has a lengthy stealth section which is basically, you know, once we've established that Joko needs to be taken down, well, we needed to find a way to get to the domain of Korna. So Gorik, Blish, and Taimi created this rift, if you could call it a teleportation portal or whatever, to send you across to the domain of Korra. And you, the player, go there after you've gotten some allies to help you out with that. So for us, we went and got the ghosts, of course. They can't be infected with the Scarab Plague. In fact, none of the non-human races of Tyria can't be affected by, you know, Scarab Plagues or whatever, so we are perfectly fine. Once we get to the domain of Korna, we use Blish's arm, cybernetic arm, to go into stealth mode and sabotage things, build a vine wall, and just scout the area in order to make it an inhabitable Elite camp later on. This is a rather fun one too because some of the achievements involve uh, blowing stuff up before Kanak even has a chance to get to his part whereas we do the south part by ourselves. I mean I really like this one. Look stealth sections in, a, in, in an MMORPG I think I, I really dislike because I'm, I don't have the patience for stealth sections at all but this one was actually rather enjoyable for me. It only got boring after I took my like fifth tune through this chapter of the episode to get to Korna. 
of course there's gonna be a shortcut there if you have the currency you can buy the living world season 4 portal the scroll that can teleport your characters across I didn't have that because I didn't have any more shared inventory access slots or whatever so I had did it entirely manual I took all of my level 80 characters to Corona by playing the story the next few chapters is all about establishing a foothold and helping the locals identify ways to survive Joko's rule essentially and trying to get them as allies in this war. The final chapter called Be My Guest is definitely one of my favorites. This is it. Be My Guest sends you and Bram into Joko's fortress to take on Palawa Joko. Now getting there is no easy feat because there's gonna be some trap and laser sections which just at first it was really frustrating and then I realized that you know I've done this before I've done this so many times in another MMORPG that does this a lot and that is the secret world slash secret world legends which has all these sabotage style missions where you have to disarm traps uh, you know just make your way around lasers and booby traps so I've done this before and I've got a lot of experience with this which actually helped it really made this section of of the be my guest chapter easier for me to navigate but I do appreciate having that in because it sort of broke the monotony a little bit because the chapters prior was getting a little dull and the story was taking a while to move on to the good bit because we all know we are going to be taking on Palau Joko. Let's get straight to the action. I want to see an all-out war, a big war with all the characters that we have. And we do have a lot of them that came with us to the domain of Corna. There's Ridlock, Timey, Bram, Kanak, Rox. But unfortunately, only Bram, again, is the guy that followed us into the heart of the fortress to take on Joko. Now, before we get to the finale, I just want to talk about this for a sec. This was supposed to be a climax of sorts. You know, it's a fight against Joko. And because of that, we do have a large cast of characters that have followed us into the domain of Corna. My issue with this is that, you know, just on virtue of all the characters that have come with us. I mean, a lot of them have stakes in this war with Joko. I mean, it's not as great or as big as the beef that we all had with Balthazar uh, from the Path of Far Expansion, but based on what Joko has done, I mean, it's a pretty significant thing. But only Bram, once again, follows us into the heart of the fortress because he's brash and he is impatient as all Norns are apparently, and that's why we end up with him. But I'm glad that it's Bram because, I don't know, it seems like I, the commander, and probably you guys might feel this too, we are like a mother or father figure to Bram considering he's now lost his mom and it's always us having to calm him down and, you know, put some sense into him. And Joko really gets under his skin with his insults, which is something I love. Uh, you know, him just calling out the Norn as a dumb race. I mean, that was pretty funny. The fight itself, when you finally get to Joko itself, the fight is pretty decent. I mean, it's easier than a lot of the boss fights from other or from previous Living Roll episodes against other bosses. But the Joko fight ended relatively quick for me. I didn't die a lot, which is also achievement in its own. And then comes the end part. You know, you thought you killed Joko. And based on everything that is said, Joko cannot die. So up he comes again in this cutscene where he's standing up and, you know, we were like, oh shit, he's not dead. He's gonna, we're going to have to fight him for a bit uh, more. Or just we don't know how we're going to stop Joko this time. And all of a sudden... Out of nowhere comes Orin, who takes him down and starts eating him. At first, I was horrified. I just stopped and watched and listened with my mouth open. And then I started laughing because, of course, that that is, that's a logical way to get rid of Joko forever, right? I mean, it was just hilarious then watching the the in-game cinematics happen of how the other characters react to that. Everyone starts coming into the throne room and, and are commenting about, oh my god, is that Orin? What is she eating? Is that Joko? What the hell? I mean, that was really, really hilarious and a nice touch too because there's a fine line between how serious, you know, you want your main story to get and then there's that comedy relief at the end too. I mean, this was just, I don't know how to put it on what scale and I don't even know the best way to describe this. It was just great. I had a smile on my face, I was laughing so much, and it really took away from the tension of, of, of you know, having just fought Palau Joko, and then the dread coming in of, oh my god, he's not gonna die, isn't he? Then Ori now starts eating him. Now, there is probably some discussions that, you know, you guys have already had, the player base that are probably speculating on what's gonna happen next. 
Orin, now that she's eaten Joko, you know, is there going to be any side effect of that? Are there going to be repercussions? I mean, she just ate Palawa Joko, and that guy is, I, I don't know, I don't even know what he's made of. So, is that going to be part of Orin now, or is Joko going to have a part of Orin now? I mean, that's for you guys to debate. Feel free to share that in the comments, and you know, what do you think about that? From a story perspective, and this is purely story now, um, I really enjoyed episode 3. I mean, it, it gives me a kick, especially Joko as an antagonist. At the very beginning, as I've said in a video prior to this, you know, when I first heard about Joko, because I never played the first Guild Wars, you guys know that. So coming into Guild Wars 2 and then, you know, learning about Joko by playing through Path of Fire and everything, I'm like, this this dude is crazy, he is nuts. And then now, he's he's like... It's not it's not in a good way. I really like how Joko is as an antagonist. He's got so much character and flavor and flair compared to like Balthazar, which is just an all out god of war. You know, so that's why I really like Joko and having him as somebody to to aspire to take down with your your group. So now that he's gone, I'm really interested to see where Guild Wars 2 takes us next with the story. Who's the new antagonist? What's going to happen? Is it going to involve Orin and what's happened uh, now that she's taken down Chiyoko? And are there going to be side effects? I mean, there's just so many possibilities with the next episode of the Living World story. I just hope it's not going to be filler episodes because that's the thing that I hated the most having played through the entirety of the Living World season uh, 2 and 3. I mean there was definitely filler episodes in those where you know it was all about getting something or getting the new mastery or just finishing the jumping puzzle that came with that episode. I hope we see less of that. I mean personally I'm sure you guys out there love jumping puzzles. I do not. <laughs> so when an episode is entirely focused on jumping puzzles I get a little annoyed. So we'll have to see. So all in all, I really enjoyed episode 3, Long Live the Lich. I hope you guys did too. Uh, and feel free to share your thoughts in the comment section below. What do you guys think of this episode? Feel free to let me know. And that wraps up my in-depth look at episode 3, Long Live the Lich. So hit the like button for more on Guild Wars 2. And feel free to subscribe to the channel for more MMO content. Once again, I'm Jerome Adrian, and I thank you for watching. Roses are red, violets are blue. If you want to watch more videos, click on these cards, anyone would do. And if you want to watch more videos, subscribe to the channel with the button down here, I know you want to.